The mesh makes computers easier to use by making them more secure. What this means at minimum is don't break the user's existing workflows. Don't interrupt them. Don't distract them. Don't pester them to provide them with security. But there's more to the mesh than that. You see, once you provide security, you know, really good security, it allows you to do different things that you couldn't do before. Adding SSL to the web allowed us to do internet commerce. It made Amazon.com possible. So what does the mesh make possible? Hello, I'm Phil Pan Baker, and in this podcast, I'm going to be answering that question. So in the last presentation, I showed how the mesh can be used to encrypt de and share documents between groups of users. So now let's see how we can apply that technology and other mesh, mesh technologies to the web. Well, the first opportunity that web gives us is that it simplifies the browsing experience because every web browser on every device Alice has, has access to her password database and her bookmarks database. So she's got a unified um, browsing experience no matter which device she's on. And potentially we've got a means of achieving handoff. Very often I'm viewing a video on you know, on my laptop, I would really like to just bounce it onto the TV. And yeah, I know that's kind of sort of there, but no, it isn't really. If you've got really good security in there and the devices can authenticate automatically, then that becomes much easier to achieve. But the main changes that it provides is we've got that credential, capabilities of the credentials are all there and we're not constantly interrupting the user by asking them to log in or create accounts or provide a password or to provide a silly number-based two-factor authentication scheme. All the authentication parts of the web turn into fluent, transparent, public key-based authentications or for the rare occasions where we want to ask the user, are you sure you want to buy that stock? Are you sure you want to transfer that money? Then we have a transaction that asks them exactly that and gives them the chance to reply in exactly that mode. So we take away the hassle and we provide them with the password and the bookmark database that unifies their browsing experience. But what more can we do? Well, the web today isn't actually end-to-end -end secure. And some of you are saying, no, but TLS, SSL, they are end-to-end -end secure. And yes, they are, but no, they're not. You see, the thing is that if Alice here is browsing and she's at some site, TLS is providing us with a secure channel to the web server. But the content that she's reading was produced by Carol. And Carol uploaded it to the, con to the web server. And the content is all sitting there on the web server unencrypted. And then Doug came along and Doug made some comments on that content. And those comments are also sitting unencrypted on the service. And so, although TLS is end-to-end, -end, the ends are not where we want them to be. The ends of this security context are not Alice and the web server. The real ends have to be Alice and Carol and Doug. And that is exactly the type of security the mesh can deliver. You see, what we do is we use the group encryption mechanism. And 
The key server can be on the site that is managing the web content, or it can be on a completely separate mesh service. Doesn't matter. There is some group out there that all the members of this group have been joined to, and there's an administrator. We'll take it as Alice, because you know, A, Alice, administrator, usually works. Um, so we have a an administrator of that um, group who can add Bob and Carol and Doug and everybody. And they can now see the content on the website. And this is very easy to do with the web because all we need to do is to create ourselves a new web browser that has the ability to recognize that ah, this content, instead of being compressed with a particular algorithm, oh, there's a new compression algorithm, but it's really cryptography. And I need to, de to decode this compression algorithm. I need to pull in the key from you know, whatever key service that needs to do the complementary part. And so what we can end up with is an end-to-end -end secure web so that all the documents that are stored in the web are encrypted. And those documents don't just need to be static documents. They can be dynamic documents commenting on uh, web content. And that's where we use our DARE envelopes and also the DARE envelope sequence. That's why DARE sequence was originally developed. It was so that we could have a web forum in which every comment that was made on a particular item was being continuously encrypted. And if you don't see the need for that, well, one of the many now breaches of the US federal government intelligence services was the Vault 7 breach, where we're still not clear exactly how the documents were leaked. Yeah, I've heard the stories, and yes, the story that is being made is that um, a person inside leaked. Another story that has been made is that they had antivirus software on their computer that did the leaking, but whichever way, one of the people who had access to that material leaked it. And the material was discussion on the use of malware to break uh, opponents' computers uh, that they were wanting to perform espionage on. And so you had this very high-level discussion. Only the access to that uh, forum wasn't just limited to the people immediately involved. It was anybody who might have had a need to have access to that content. And so that's a lot more people. If we can make the web server encrypted, then we take a large number of people out of the equation because the administrator of the web server, of which there are many in a government situation, the people who have access to the backups and all that chain no longer have access. We can restrict access on a need to know. And in a corporation, obviously, this means that you can have a comment server for your C-suite discussing really important things that isn't vulnerable if Peggy in accounts happens to download a virus onto a machine that infects the whole company. So end-to-end -end secure should mean end-to-end -end secure, and that should mean that the content is encrypted on the web server and protected the whole life cycle. And the mesh allows us to do that by using the metacryptography, the key splitting technique I showed several times already. So we've got our web 1.0 content, the static content, and we've even got dynamic content. And so this means that at this point, we can create Facebook, but with encrypted a private version of Facebook in which the only people who have access 
two sets of data are the people who in control that forum and invited other people into that conversation. And so we can have private discussions on the internet without them being mediated by big corporation or big intelligence agency run by an authoritarian state. So, so we can do a Facebook, we can do a discuss, but you know, what would that look like? Well, one hole in the market I see there is for a way of sharing bookmarks between groups of people of advanced interest, academic, professional, that type of thing. Why bookmarks? Well, when I look at uh, my use of Facebook, I see that about 10% of my art articles I post are just tracking personal events. And then 20% maybe, uh, which is rather higher than most people, is that I'm posting is articles that I've actually written myself. And then the other 70% odd is reposting articles that have been published elsewhere that I'm saying, hey, look, we should discuss this. And, you know, most of those will be, you know, I'll, I'll be pointing somebody to The Guardian, The Washington Post, New York Times, BBC or whatever, and, uh, or another blog, or some material that somebody else has written and forwarded. So discussion of bookmarks is actually pretty important stuff. And with the mesh, what we could do is have, go back to an idea that, uh, John Mallory and Roger Hurwitz were developing right back in the very earliest days of the web. They ran a discussion forum called the Al Gore's Open Meeting, and this was run for Vice President Al Gore. They were work. Uh, Roger and um, John were at the um, MIT AI lab at the time, and they were running this project for the new uh, administration. And what it was, was it was a review of all the policies that the Clint incoming Clinton administration was proposing to government. And it was a way of getting, you know, the, the situation in government is that you have a pyramid like this. And most of the time, the political appointees at the top, they know what they want to do. And most of the time, the folk at the bottom of the pyramid they also, you know, there's usually, regardless of what the colour of the administration is, there's usually a lot of agreement between the top and the bottom of the pyramid about what needs to change because, you know, the, the policy people, they, you, you know, they usually are working in good faith and they're usually coming in with a programme that actually makes sense uh, at some level and uh, is dealing with at least some set of real problems that are occurring and are being seen at the bottom of the pyramid. The, pro the obstacle to getting things done is getting buy-in from this middle group. And these are the people who are the gatekeepers. You know, they've hit the glass ceiling in the civil service. You know, you, you get to a certain point and you can only rise if you're a political appointee, which is a particular problem in the US uh, civil service. Uh, and, you know, for them, change is a career risk, but not necessarily any potential for a career reward. So these people are the people who have to be won over. And they're the, also the people who are saying, hold on, if you change this thing, then there's this other thing in this other part of the government that maybe you weren't thinking of uh, that also has to be thought of if you make a change here, you're going to want to think about this thing here as it's going to affect this thing here. So anyway, they were running this uh, website for the federal government and it looked a lot like Facebook and there were a set of documents that were uploaded and then people could comment on them and say, I agree, I disagree, uh, I can propose a promising practice, I can ask a question. I can propose an alternative. And so there was this structured dialogue with weekly typed links. Uh, a con 
that uh, I think that we should go back to and we should try again now that people are more used to the tropes of Web 2.0. Let's go back to the original plan and see what we can make use of these advanced Web 2.0 features. So what I'm looking at building here is Facebook in which the users have control, not some corporation. And so this is going back to one of the other things that came in with the very early web. The one of the reasons that the web was so successful was that when the web came along, US corporate uh, media had invested tens of millions of dollars in a scheme called interactive te television. And this was really big for Time Water in the 1980s. And they did a big trial. And they had big televisions, five foot streams that they put into people's homes. And people hated it. Because all, their, all the interaction that there was in this interactive television was you could watch a movie and then buy a mug or a t-shirt. Interactive didn't mean interactive. It meant a different way to sell your stuff. The web took over because it allowed people to express themselves and allow them to interact, which is something that, you know, the folk who were developing interactive television never really thought of. They never thought of user-generated content. You know, the idea of YouTube uh, and that people might actually upload videos that they actually created themselves rather than just ripping off other people's, you know, existing TV s series. Uh, that also came much later. So we can use the mesh to reclaim social media and make it something for the people rather than something that's controlled by the uh, corporations. And so shared bookmarks between small groups of people who are focused on a technical niche. You know, we can have uh, discussions for discussing, say, the mesh itself. You know, people who have an interest in cryptography have an expertise in security. And we can have an informed discussion rather than have the level of discourse set by whoever is the angriest and whoever has been manipulated by the most aggressive foreign intelligence disinformation campaign. So that's what I would like to see for the future of the web. And end-to-end -end security may be one of the things that makes that possible. So that's the web. In the next episode, I'm going to be looking at how we can apply the mesh to improve another existing application, and that's SSH, the remote terminal uh, scheme. So please stay for that, and please click like, and please subscribe. Uh, it's important. Thank you very much.